And joining us now to debate the effects the digital revolution is having on literacy. In Phoenix, Arizona, Alice Robison, professor of English at Arizona State University. In Chicago, Illinois, Nicole Pinker, director of innovation, University of Chicago's Urban Education Institute. And here in studio, Mark Fetterman, researcher with OISE, the Ontario Institute of Studies in Education. And we welcome back Andrea Lunsford from Stanford University in Palo Alto, California. Welcome everybody on the other side of the border. We like to call this program uh, Your Agenda because our program topics are very much influenced by the emails we get from our viewers. And here's the email that led us down the path for tonight's discussion. Researchers argue that there are very important differences between the reading of physical and digital texts. The kind of Im uh, immersion and the tactile hand and eye interaction that a physical book allows is simply not possible with digital materials and that this has huge implications for how deeply we read, know, or can reflect on what we read. I think it would make a great agenda program to discuss the implications of the transition to digital dominance in reading for learning in the 21st century. Bob MacArthur, we thank you for that email, and here we go. Let me start with you, Mark. What, in your view, does it mean to be literate today? I think it means an appreciation of contexts, diverse contexts, in uh, traditional literacy, with, particularly with the printed word, we knew that the author had to put everything onto the page. So it was all very explicit. It was all mandated for us. Sure, we would be transported to an imaginary world, let's say, with fiction. But today, we have to not only supply our own context, but understand the context from the place, location, that might be geographic, it might be cultural, it might be psychological, of those people from around the world that are now juxtaposed with us. So it's a much more complex endeavor to understand literacy. Let me follow up on the call. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, you'd say literacy meant being able to read, being able to write. Is it more than that today? Yes, I believe it is. And in particular, is one of the things we need to think about is students that we're teaching today, we're not just preparing them for today, we're preparing them for the future. I have an 18-year-old stepson who's a senior. When he was born, um, the internet, the uh, wide, uh, World Wide Web didn't exist, the smartphone didn't exist, uh, Facebook and MySpace. So schools always have to think ahead and prepare the kids for the future that they're entering. How about you, Alice? What do you think it means to be literate today? Well, I would agree with Mark. I do believe that it depends very much on context. I think that in a lot of ways in digital spaces, we are um, experiencing a much bigger variety of context. But more than that, we're not just consuming what's going on on the web and in digital spaces. We're also um, producing, and that adds um, sort of a sharper level of complexity that's required, as Nicole said. Andrew Lunsford, do you want to come in on that? Yes, I think today literacy means uh, much more than the consumption of text, which is really what it meant in the past. I've, if you could write your name, and then, then if you could consume, and you could read directions, you could read books, and you could make sense of the world. But today, I'd say the production part of it is, is as important, if not more important, than the consumption part. So students, young people are writing more, I think, more than ever in the history of the world. And I think that's a good thing. Reading is changing as the, your questioner. That's an absolutely wonderful question. Uh, reading is changing. Uh, online reading is different from reading uh, in a book. But also, the material that we're reading is changing. And I, I think particularly of the infusion of the visual into texts now. And we need to, literacy needs to encompass uh, understanding and interpreting visual data, symbols, uh, visual symbols of all kinds, as well as words. Of course, they're images as well. Andrew, you say that they're writing more than ever. A question I'm going to pursue a little later as we go along is whether they're writing better than ever. But hold on to that for a second. Uh, we've got a magazine in this city called Toronto Life, and this is a piece written by a Ryerson University professor named Gregory Levy uh, in the October issue. I want to read an excerpt of it. He talks about the more time I spend with my students, the more I have begun to feel that in the decades separating us, technology has changed daily life so radically that our worldviews differ in irreconcilable ways. So for the past few months, I've been trying to decide if what I see in my classroom is just your typical generational change, the kind that every generation complains about, or if something more seismic is going on. I now believe that today's students are, for the most part, ill-suited to a university education. 
and that the fissure that currently exists between schools and students is unbridgeable. Wow. Nicole, I'd like to get your view on that. What do you think? Actually, I think um, they have a point there. Um, schools, we've often thought our ability to learn was very much connected by the people who could be put in front of us to teach us. But what the Internet has done, what Web 2.0 has done, is made it possible for us to access knowledge and mentors and teachers from all the way around the world. So technically, your ability to learn isn't, isn't, isn't based purely on where you live or the university that you go to. So I think we are having to rethink ways of teaching and learning and who we learn from and, and how we learn and when we learn. Mark? And I, oh. I think that um, Professor Levy has it exactly backwards. It's not that the students are ill-suited for the universities. It's that the universities are ill-suited for today's students and indeed ill-suited for today's society. Our university has changed very little since the 17th century, since the Enlightenment. I mean, we have fancy gadgets, but it's essentially the same structure, the same methods, the same everything. We are in fundamentally a, a profoundly different era because of the instantaneous communication, what Marshall McLuhan identified back in the 60s. In fact, McLuhan had the same experience when he started teaching, that he couldn't understand his students, mm. and so had to do a study of pop culture to be able to understand how to make education relevant. And we're faced with the same challenge today. Alice Robinson. Yes, I would say that it's not so much that the world has changed um, as a result of technologies, but I think that the technologies have made those changes way more visible, way more debatable, um, way more open. And um, I do think, agree, and I definitely agree with Mark, that um, schools are extraordinarily ill-suited um, in the sense that not because they have um, trouble helping kids be prepared for the future. I think that a lot of schools are doing a fantastic job of that. Um, but instead, they're working under old models of how we think and how we learn. And those models are in direct contrast with what kids are doing out of school. Um, so it's really no, no wonder why kids would want to um, flock to these other spaces, because they just happen to reflect um, better research on what we know about how kids learn. Andrea Lunsford, I want to read the last line of that quote to you again and get you to react to it. The fissure that currently exists between schools and students is unbridgeable. What do you say to that? I say if I thought that were true, I'd have to jump off the Hoover Tower here on the Stanford <laughs> campus. So I, I don't think that is uh, true, although I agree with Mark that our universities are ill-suited to the students that we have today. I think that's why in the Stanford study of writing, the students kept pointing to instances where they were in charge, where they had some agency, where they were determining the assignments, where they were out in the field doing things, making knowledge that way. That's what appealed to them. That rather than sitting in a large lecture hall for, for two hours listening to the same voice go on and on and on. This is, uh, at the risk of getting off topic here, Mark, but since you work for an organization, a, a very prominent institute that, that studies how people should be educated, mm -hmm. is anybody thinking about the fact that you believe we've got it all, if you'll forgive uh, the way I put it here, ask backwards? That's a really good question. Um, institutionally, uh, at, in, the, in the teacher ed, uh, initial teacher ed program, they're doing the best they can to cope with the curriculum that's been delivered by the policymakers. Right. Mm -hmm. So if we actually trace back to where the problem is, the problem is really among those people in the Ministry of Education, Departments of Education throughout North America and indeed around the world to actually understand what we need for the future. In the graduate school, however, there are a number of researchers looking at alternative methods, how to incorporate not the technology for technology's sake, but the connectivity, the yeah. connection, the ability to construct knowledge and to value the life experiences, to be able to bring those in and allow students time and place to reflect in order to understand what it means to actually produce knowledge rather than consume knowledge. Alice Robinson, how does it work at your university in terms of whether you've got that balance right between what the university offers and what your students need today to be literate in a digital world? Well, I would say that ASU, Arizona State University, in terms of enrollment, is the largest university in the U.S. at this point. Um, and so having said that, it's you know, a wide variety of approaches and methods, but one thing that we've managed to do quite well is create a transdisciplinary, transdisciplinary environment. And the reason why that's important is because 
people are always writing and reading and thinking um, for some reason, for some contest, context, um, for some audience. And it's important then for them to get experience working across campus and understanding, for example, even within the humanities, it's a different story to write a paper for a film class than it is for um, an art history class than it is for a literature course. And it's often the instructors themselves who don't quite realize that there, is those, there are those differences. Um, and same in the social sciences. Um, it's very different to write in psychology or sociology than it is in anthropology, or to write a quantitative um, piece of work versus a qualitative piece of work. Students are very savvy. They um, ask those questions all the time. That's why we get the most popular question on campus w for instructors is, what do you want? And uh, the students wouldn't be asking those questions if they didn't know that there are different reasons to write and different contexts to write in and for different purposes. Okay, Nicole, at this point I want to double back to that comment that Andrea Lunsford made earlier in our discussion, which was, yes, students are writing more than ever, but are they writing better than ever? The students that you deal with, Nicole, what do you say? I think it, hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, if I look at the qualities of, of the work that our kids are creating, I think it's, the quality is the same as it's always been. What's interesting, I think, is that oftentimes the writing that they're doing is invisible because we have a lot of kids, for instance, who are doing documentary films in the seventh grade all the way through twelfth grade. And what most people see is the final product, which is the video. But there's a lot of writing that takes place. We recently had a group of three 10th graders who created a 15-minute uh, documentary that made it to some film fest festivals. Um, and their script went through 25 revisions. It was a 30-page script that went through 25 right. revisions. That's more writing than those same kids would have done on any school assignment paper. And the quality of the script made a good, um, made a very high-quality documentary. So I think one of the interesting things about the digital realm is it forces kids to iterate because their audience, they know who the audience is and they're very, um, they want to create a good product. And so it forces them, them to rethink what they're writing and to, and to put it in a, in a different light. So in some sense I think it probably is, the quality is getting better in some context. I, I won't necessarily say that the quality that they're doing for school assignments where they don't necessarily believe that they have an audience that matters. Um, is changing that much. Andrea Lunsford, you put this out there in the first place. You said they're writing more than ever, but in your experience, are they writing better than ever? Across the board, I would be hard put to have any evidence to say that the writing is better than ever. I really take uh, Nicole's point about the documentary. That's a fantastic example of all the unseen writing that goes on. I think that it's, uh, it's safe to say that the quality of student writing when the students are engaged in the writing is probably better than it's ever been. But writing itself is changing so dramatically. We really don't have a, a definition of writing that suffices to cover all of the activities that, that young people are doing with writing. So it's hard sometimes to even separate reading, writing, or speaking. They all go together on the web in the digital environment. But I'm certainly not depressed about the state of student writing. Uh, not just the opposite. I think the, the sky's the limit where writing is concerned and young people today. Mark Fetterman? I think we, we, we're stuck in this old conception that speaking comes out of our mouths and writing comes out of our fingers. Because mm -hmm. if you think about Twitter, if you think of messaging, orality now comes out of our fingers on the keyboard. And yeah very much f more formal presentation comes out of our mouths. So there's a reversal that's going on. Mm -hmm. But as, uh, you know, I love the idea in Stanford where they talk about uh, rhetoric as performative mm -hmm. because really what we're doing or what we used to do in the old era with writing was performing our ideas onto paper. And now we don't have to perform them onto paper. We perform them in person, we perform them on video, we perform them through artistic uh, bodily expressions, dance, and so forth. The issue is really getting the ideas and knowledge and, ex and collected experiences on which we reflect out into the world. And that goes well beyond paper, and therefore the conventional idea of writing. So the question, is writing better, is the wrong question. Are we performing our ideas in a way that conveys it to more people in more diverse ways that are more 
uh, understood across diverse cultures if that's than a, ever before. That's a better question, and, and you think the answer is a yes Absolutely to that. yes, without a doubt. You know, you four, I'm sure, didn't see this, but throughout the course of the program today, we are running, um, what is it, excerpts, I guess, of emails and, and tweets that we get from people. Who One just came up on the screen, and I must confess, I almost had a heart attack when I read it. It says, if you can't say it in 140 characters, it isn't worth saying, <laughs> which is a, a reference, of course, <laughs> to how many characters you have when you tweet on Twitter. Now, I mean, Alice, th that's going to be just incredibly offensive to, <laughs> to a lot of people. Uh, what do you think when you hear somebody say, if you can't say it in 140 characters, then it ain't worth saying? I, uh, I would agree. <laughs> you would um, agree? I think that, yeah, I would. And um, I think that um, folks who, for example, give presentations in public spaces are often the... Um, first folks to understand that. Um, news reporters who have public feeds know that um, you got to say it quickly and you got to uh, make your point tweetable. Um, I've said in the past that uh, if you can't hone your idea down to that short, pithy statement, which is not exactly anything new to those of us who have things to say, um, then it, it isn't necessarily effective. Folks need to remember those quick, pithy statements and your argument should be honed. Um, to that short of a space. But, you know, Twitter is one of the most exciting literacy spaces that I've ever seen, and it is constantly negotiated um, every moment of every day, and there are hundreds of decisions that you have to make when you decide to use Twitter. And that's one of the um, most interesting things, is that um, we're not just talking about consumption or reading on the web. We're talking about participation, which means um, production within particular contexts. Uh, it's one thing to make um, a Wikipedia edit. Um, it's a totally different thing to be a regular author in the Wikipedia community. Uh, you have to understand those people. You have to understand those systems. And it's the same with Twitter. I have a private feed. I have a public feed. And uh, those are completely different spaces, um, even though many of my um, work colleagues see my private feed. So okay, um, but those Alice, decisions I'm gonna are incessant. The, I'm going to ask the follow-up question now that I know many of our viewers want me to ask, which <laughs> is, you know, you do, you're, you're a university professor, right? You do believe in books, right? Oh, absolutely. I'm in an English department, for exactly. sure. Exactly. So when you're saying you've got to be able to sum it up in 140 characters, you're referring to Twitter only. You're not saying for every communications um, metric across the board. I'm referring to um, when you're trying to make a point, when you're trying to say something. Um, it's common knowledge on Twitter that, um, hey, guess what? It's microblogging. Uh, that means get your point across quickly. Uh, that means people are not going to read your um, five tweets in a row or constant posting of links to external sites um, without any language or context around them. Uh, we just don't have time even for those short spaces. So if you've got a point and uh, you have to make it, make it quickly uh, because we've got a hundred other points we've got to read in the span of five minutes. Okay, Nicole, do you want to weigh in on this? If you can't say it in 140 <laughs> characters, it isn't worth saying? I think it depends on the context and it depends on, in some sense, the platform that you're reading from. So if I'm uh, trying to look at information on my iPhone, then yes, I think, you know, it needs to be short and, and pithy. But if I'm at home on my laptop and I have a big screen in front of me, 140 characters is probably too little. But the 100, what Twitter does enable me to do is to decide whether I want to explore something in more depth. So I can, I can read through, you know, 100 uh, tweets and figure out the 10 that I want to explore, click on the links and, and explore right. in more depth than if I had to read through 120, you know, one page uh, synopsis of, of the point to get me to, to, to move forward. So I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bridging, the tweets, the 140 is a bridge for me to figure out where I want to focus in more, more, in more detail. Okay, Andrea Lunsford then, the follow-up to that is how important are skills in your view such as multitasking, the ability to sift through information to what I guess you all have described today as the kind of new literacy that we're talking about? Well, the amount of information that we have to deal with is indeed uh, daunting. I think there's no doubt that we need to help students understand how to work with sources and how to discriminate among the all of the information hitting them so hard. But I, well, I just want to say one word about Twitter. I am a fan of the Twitter, especially the Twitter haiku contests, which I think are quite wonderful, that set of constraints that Twitter 
puts on a writer are no different really than a, a person sitting down to write a sonnet or a villanelle or some other form, a formal constraint that you can operate beautifully in or not so beautifully. I mean, Robert Frost says, what's the sense of writing uh, poetry without rhyme? It's like playing tennis without the net down. So this is, some of that goes for Twitter as well. But in terms of the information age and the inundation of, our, uh, of, of all of us with uh, inf information and material, we have to have ways to discriminate and sort. And I, I think we just can't let Google do it for us. Uh, Google brings up the, the most frequently uh, um, called upon pieces of information. That's, some, that's often not good enough especially if students are engaged in research. And I don't think that, that every point can be made in 140 characters. I disagree with that completely. I think there are many times when what's called for is a lengthy, very subtly nuanced argument that may be, need to be sustained across 20 or 30 pages. And certainly students come on situations where they need to do that kind of writing as well. They need to be able to make a point and sustain it. And if we want students to be able to do that, then we're going to have to teach them and work with them on, uh, on developing those abilities. Let me show really a couple a of, all right, sorry, Alice, you wanted a last word on that part? Well, I would just say that um, one of the most important things, though, that we teach in academic uh, writing classes is the thesis. And uh, I think that Twitter, um, more than anything, forces revision, which is one of the most important um, aspects of writing classes on college campuses, in my opinion. Let's show some graphics here. This is, um, this is going to come as very welcome news to a lot of people who have been very fearful about the level of literacy and the rates in this society and south of the border. These numbers come from the U.S. National Endowment of the Arts. And for the first time in the history of the survey, conducted five times since 1982, you can see that blue line on the screen after going down and down and down is now going up. Overall, adult literacy reading rates rising. Literary reading increasing most rapidly among the youngest adults. Uh, I'd like to know from the four of you who spend your lives studying these trends, why, after years and years of having that blue line and that red line go down, suddenly it's going back up. Mark, got any theories? Harry Potter, Twilight. <laughs> we're, we're producing, we as a society are producing literature that speaks to the issues and concerns of, um, of young people in, their, in a language that they can appreciate. And, you know, Harry Potter, uh, just as an example, isn't Dickens. <laughs> Um, but that's, then again, young good. people don't want to read Dickens. Yeah. The other thing is, of course, that our high school English programs, at least in, in Toronto Board, uh, where my kids went through the school system, um, teaches students that literature is a chore. Literature is not to be appreciated. It is to be dissected and, and turned into something dry and stale and, and, and horrible. My daughter hated English throughout uh, uh, high school. Because it was, you know, in what scene did Macbeth say so and so to such and such? Mm -hmm. But now she consumes good literature, and you know, in uh, as an adjunct to her technical studies in university, because she appreciates good writing. And she knows about Harry and Hermione and all well, those. Well, she doesn't things. actually read Harry Potter. She reads. Uh, she's reading Charles Bukowski and and other like you know, <laughs> very difficult stuff. And as I say, she's. Uh, She's uh, not a humanities major by any stretch. Okay, I get, you know, we've got a guest from Chicago here, so Nicole, I should ask you, you want to give Oprah's Book Club some of the you know, props on this as well? Uh, definitely. Chicago has something called One Book, One Chicago, where everyone's supposed to read the same book. And recently we just did a project with the Chicago Public Libraries where we opened up a new youth library which has access to laptops and kids can play video games and make music. But what's a surprising fact, we're in our fourth month opening, is that the book circulation, the young adult book circulation has skyrocketed. Kids are reading. I mean, you know, all the books are there and they're picking them up. They're reading a lot more graphic no novels and manga, but they're also reading a lot more informational text. So a kid who wants to make music is saying, hey, let me check out this book about GarageBand. But they're also checking out all kinds of other books, too. So um, I think there's a way, there's a convergence of new media and old media, and it's not that one has to take the place of the other. Andrea Lunsford, what's your theory on this? 
I'm so glad uh, Nicole mentioned graphic novels because I think that's responsible for a good part of, of this trend. I mean, I teach a class on graphic novels at Stanford, uh, sometimes an undergrad, sometimes a grad class. And the excitement around the, the really the explosion of energy in terms of producing graphic novels. Young people are now writing them as well as reading them. But they are some pretty sophisticated pieces of work. And again, they, they call on very different kinds of reading abilities. If, if your listeners haven't taken a look at Chris Ware's Jimmy Corgan, The Smartest Kid on Earth, and I urge everybody to go out and take a look at that book. I, I've taught it, but it, I can't say that I can read it using any traditional reading strategies. It calls on me to develop new, new ways to read and engage in that literature. But the explosion um, of graphic novels, and graphic narrative, I should say, rather than novels, uh, is, is definitely, in my mind, related to more and more reading by young people. And a quick follow-up, Andrea. For those who want to dismiss graphic novels as kind of just fancy comic books, you say what? I say take a look at Mouse, um, Art Spiegelman's masterpiece on the Holocaust. Uh, it's pretty, pretty serious and pretty sophisticated stuff. You are right about that. Alice Robinson, let's hear you on this. Um, one of the most exciting things about reading these days is that it's way more social than it used to be. Um, it's no longer regulated to um, women and um, small reading groups. Um, that kids have become extraordinarily social online as well. Um, the reading of um, and the fan fiction that goes around things like Harry Potter um, and some of the texts that Andrea mentioned um, is absolutely extraordinary. And Rebecca Black's work at the University of California at Irvine um, has chronicled mm -hmm. that, and I really recommend her work. Hmm. I think there's one more factor, and that goes back to the issue of context. In the social world, in Facebook, Twitter, MySpace, and so on, the youth today are using cultural references. And you need to understand the cultural references to be able to participate. In other words, you have to bring in that context. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that context comes from this literature. So if you're not reading the literature, right. you're out of the loop in terms of understanding the references and what's going on in the social milieu. No, that's a fine point. But uh, Nicole, let me follow it up with this. They're reading a lot, and the numbers show that reading is going up, and that's great. Uh, but it doesn't. Here's the debate: Is it important that they be reading, for example, uh, *To Kill a Mockingbird*, or is it okay if they're just reading somebody's long um, recitation of an important point in their life on Facebook? Is reading reading, in other words? Well, I think you have to start where kids are, and you have to get them reading. But I think very few kids just do one. So kids are reading *To Kill a Mockingbird*, and they're also spending time reading Facebook, and they're multitasking back and forth. So I think they need to understand context and they need to understand code switching and they need to understand what does it mean to communicate in Facebook because imagine how if you talk about a kid today in 10 years that's going to be not necessarily Facebook but those type of platforms are still going to be tremendously important for communicating so I think it's important that they do both. Now Mark I need you on this one because last year the Canadian Council on Learning put a report out that's saying 48 percent of adult Canadians have low literacy skills. That's the way they described it. And they forecasted that number will remain unchanged through the year 2031 unless something's done to address it. Uh, a, does that resonate with you? B, if it does, what needs to be done? I would agree that a high percentage of adult Canadians have low literacy skills because they've been taught out of us in the generation that came through the schools you know, over the past 10, 20 years. I think, it, however, it's changing because of that graph that you showed a few minutes ago, that we're seeing literacy of all types increasing, not just reading books, but reading all sorts of media, and learning how to read media, learning how to code switch, as, as uh, we just heard, learning how to contextualize, and learning how to bring in diverse contexts and put it all together. Somebody should just explain that, code switch. What does that mean? Um, what that means is uh, that we um, understand the type of medium for the type of, of content, the type of effect we want to have, as McLuhan called it, the message. So we use a particular medium to create a particular effect. We bring in another one to, to augment that effect. And we are very cognizant of the types of audiences that, that we want to reach in what way. So again, the earlier example, if I'm writing for a professor, versus writing for my friends, versus writing for my parents. Okay. Um, Andrea Lunsford, do you mm -hmm. think that texting and all of the kind of short forms that people use while they're texting, does that actually bolster literacy? 
I don't have empirical evidence uh, to speak to this, but my experience is that it's giving more flexibility and more, more variety to literate skills. So I don't think that, I think, I think young people today have like a number of quivers um, in their in their, or his arrows, they have a number of arrows, arrows in their in the quivers. Quiver. That they, yeah, that's right, arrows in, the, arrows in the quiver. That they can do the texting at will, they can do other kinds of writing, they can do speaking, they can do performing, they can bring in um, storytelling uh, uh, projects that they may put on the air, they can do all of those things. There are very different skills involved in each one of those genres. So I don't think that texting means the death of, uh, of another kind of let's say print literacy, I think it's change and it's a, something different, but it's not to the detriment of traditional literacy. Alice, I don't have to tell you, there'll be many people watching who will say, give me a break. This is dumbing it down. Texting is not literacy. What do you say to them? <laughs> well, I would say that it's a myth that um, kids are the only ones who are texting. Uh, take a look anywhere and you'll see a lot of parents right. um, yeah, a lot of parents um, find it extraordinarily important to learn how to text, uh, especially when they want to get in touch with their kids during the day. Um, and kids may or may not be allowed to turn their phones on um, in the classroom, but a parent still may need to get in touch with that student. Um, so there's a lot of sort of under the desk <laughs> texting going on that, um, that I'm witnessing when I visit schools. Um, so, yeah. Nicole, what do you say on this issue of whether or not texting is making idiots out of us all or actually improving <laughs> literacy? Well, I mean, again, literacy is, lit the definition of literacy changes, and literacy is about communicating, and so you have to use the proper syntax symbol system for who you want to communicate with. So if we're communicating with phones and, and we have these limitations on characters in some sense, then texting is a, a great way to communicate. So, Mark, uh, let me just make sure I got this clear. Twitter, video blogging, gaming, 140 character maximum, this all <laughs> promotes literacy. Different sort of literacy. Different, Different sort sorts of, of literacy. literacy. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to change our notion that literacy is exclusively what appears on a piece of paper because <laughs> as much paper as we have in our world, there are other ways of expressing our ideas, and that's what it's all about. Well, let me do something very old-fashioned here and talk about two things that um, I don't think people who text or email uh, worry about too much. Spelling and grammar. Okay. Uh, Nicole, in a world where everybody's texting now and nobody seems to care about spelling or grammar, uh, am I an old-fashioned nerd for wondering whether or not spelling and grammar matter anymore? No, I mean, actually, in a text world, spelling and grammar do matter because the the intentional uh, um, um, leaving out of letters are important. So um, you have to be conscious of how you're actually uh, spelling. I mean, when I write emails and when I text, I'm, I'm probably a little more conscious than when I'm writing something out in, in freehand in terms of how I'm actually spelling and how I'm constructing the uh, sentence. Alice, that, what, uh, the, mm -hmm. sorry, Alice, spelling and grammar, what do you think? I would say that spelling and grammar are absolutely very important. The real question is, and the real definition of literacy is, how do you know when and where and why it's important? People have made arguments about grammar for centuries, um, and people have made arguments about the fall of um, our you know, literacies um, for centuries. Plato argued this when the Industrial Revolution came along um, and folks were coming in from the fields, um, bosses who were trying to train um, employees to use machines made these same arguments, same with the GI Bill and same in um, the 70s when the City Un University of New York started making universities um, and college education more available to more people who weren't trained um, or weren't privileged enough to go to schools where they were asked to read um, things like Moby Dick and study them and read them at home. So I think that um, it's very dangerous to make those kinds of arguments without understanding um, the history of the power differentials that those arguments enable. Andrea Lunsford, you've already told us that your students are very bright, very motivated, very ambitious to do well. Do they spell well? Do they know how to use grammar properly? Yes, the spell checkers have taken care of a lot of our problems in terms of spelling. <laughs> Amen for that. A study I did 30 years ago showed spelling was the biggest error in college student writing by 300 percent, and I replicated that study a, a year and a half ago, and spelling is way down around number seven or eight in the typical errors, and those are 
usually homonyms or proper nouns that students don't know how to spell. Interestingly enough, though, that same study showed that the, um, the most prevalent error today is wrong word, and that also is uh, uh, due to spell checkers, I think. I saw one uh, essay that had this sentence, I am so necrotic. <laughs> and I'm certain the student meant I am so neurotic. <laughs> and I feel certain that also that the spell checker suggested that. And the student said, that looks good to me. So we win some and we lose some. But we need to remember that uh, in, in English, uh, spelling and grammar change as well. I, I believe that before I check out completely, a lot is going to be one word. I even saw it in the New York Times, A-L-O-T, uh, recently. So that would be a change in spelling. So we, we see these changes as, as the decades and the centuries go on. But you saw it in the New York Times uh, presented as if it were correct or clearly it was a mistake? Yes, presented as if it were correct. Boy, is that allowed? And it may be correct in another <laughs> year or so. It's not correct. A lot is two words. Yeah, is that allowed? Well. A-L-O-U-D. <laughs> and actually, actually, that brings out another point. Um, we're training, our, our young people are training to read through their ears. So if you see, for example, mm, yep. the letter C, the letter U, the letter L, right. an 8 and an R, see you later, uh, there, there you, you have it. Um, I, was, I was waiting for the end of the program to put that up, but that's how, that's how yep. kids spell. For the, for but those the idea who is, know, we, later. We, that goes in through our eyes, but is processed mm. in the, oh, you know, right. the audile circuitry in our brain. We hear it. And so the issue of grammar has to do, again, with the issue of performativity. If we have, if we encourage students to read their written work aloud, so it goes out of their mouths and into their ears, they pick up an awful lot of grammar and diction and, and sentence construction. And uh, that's, again, something that was not well trained uh, through the primary and secondary mm -hmm. schools, uh, where students are, say, just put it on the paper and that's it. Students perform it they then learn how to, uh, how to write properly with good grammar and so on because it sounds right or sounds better than a, another way. Nicole, we've got about a minute and a half to go here and I want to ask you this question in conclusion. Will 21st century literacy come down to those who know how to use technology and those who don't? I think it'll come down to those who can produce the, um, and those who can consume. Um, when we think about digital natives, all digital natives can consume media, but all kids cannot produce media. So I think that's the next divide that we have to think about is not who has access, but who has the power to create the media. Alice, let me get you on that too. I would agree with Nicole, but I would extend that to participation. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, it's one thing, again, to, to know how to make a video or a fan video and upload it to YouTube. It's a different thing to understand um, how are you going to get more hits and how are you going to be respected among those who make fan videos. Hmm. Last 20 seconds, Mark, on this. Let's harken back to an old writer, James Joyce. In Finnegan's Wake, he said, my consumers are not, are they not my producers? And what we're looking forward in, in the 21st century is an, an explosion of producers of great ideas and a great world. Let me thank this thoroughly literate lot, both digitally and otherwise, for coming on the program tonight and sharing their views. Uh, Andrea Lunsford at Stanford University in Palo Alto, California. Alice Robison, Arizona State University out of Phoenix. Nicole Pinkard, University of Chicago. Mark Fetterman here in studio at OISE, the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. Thanks so much, everybody. Enjoyed it very much. <laughs>